Ready? Okay. Good morning, everyone. This is the public hearing of the Committee of the Whole regarding bill numbers 130489, 140140, 140144, 140145, 140146, 140147, and 140148, and resolution 140159. I would ask Ms. Lewis to please read the titles of the bills and resolution. Bill number 130489, an ordinance amending Chapter 19-2500 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Real Estate Non-Utilization Tax by changing certain tax rates all under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 140140, an ordinance amending Chapter 19-1500 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Wage and Net Profit Tax by decreasing the rate or rates of tax imposed on certain low-income persons, providing for refunds of excess taxes paid, directing the Revenue Department to develop procedures and forms whereby eligible taxpayers can obtain such refunds, and requiring employers to provide refund forms to employees, all under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 140144, an ordinance to adopt a capital program for the six fiscal years 2015 through 2020 inclusive. Bill number 140145, an ordinance to adopt the fiscal 2015 capital budget. Bill number 140146, an ordinance adopting the operating budget for fiscal year 2015. Bill number 140147, an ordinance amending section 19-1806 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Authorization of Realty Use and Occupancy Tax to further authorize the Board of Education of the School District of Philadelphia to impose a tax on the use or occupancy of, of real estate within the School District of Philadelphia under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 140148, an ordinance amending section 19-1801 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Authorization of Tax to further authorize the Board of Education of the School District of Philadelphia to impose a tax on real estate within the City of Philadelphia under certain terms and conditions. Resolution number 140159, providing for the approval by the Council of the City of Philadelphia of a revised five-year financial plan for the City of Philadelphia covering fiscal years 2015 through 2019 and incorporating proposed changes with respect to fiscal year 2014, which is to be submitted by the Mayor to the Pennsylvania Intergovernmental Cooperation Authority, the authority pursuant to the Intergovernmental Cooperation Agreement, authorized by an ordinance this Council approved by the Mayor on January 3rd, 1992, Bill number 1563-A, by and between the City and the Authority. <laughs> you did that all in one breath? In one breath. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Uh, today we continue the public hearing of the Committee of the Whole to consider various bills read by Ms. Lewis that constitute proposed operating and capital spending measures for the fiscal year 2015, a capital program, and a forward-looking capital plan for fiscal year 2015 through fiscal year 2020. Uh, this morning, before we hear testimony from the City Departments, I would like to note for the record two items. First, please note that Bill number 140140, the low-income tax credit and 130489 real estate non-utilization tax will not be considered today at the request of the sponsor and be rolled over and recessed along with all other bills being considered in this budget hearing. Uh, at this time I want to go into a public meeting very briefly so that we can offer three amendments to the capital program and capital budget. The three amendments are to provide capital funding to the Betsy Ross House, Philadelphia History Museum, formerly known as the Atwood of Kent, and the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'd like to explain the reason for offering these amendments at this time. As submitted to Council, the proposed capital program and capital budget for fiscal year 15 authorizes no funding for the Betsy Ross House, Philadelphia History Museum, and Free Library of Philadelphia. The, the amendments in question will add 2,900,000 uh, 2.9 million in, in new dollars to the, cap, to the FY15 capital program and capital budget and allocated in the following manner. $250,000 to the Betsy Ross House, a city-owned historic landmark by, among other things, replacing the chiller and air conditioning unit, upgrading the fire security system, installing new emergency lighting, renovating public restrooms, and making improvements to the handicap accessibility areas at the main building and its annex. $250,000 to the Philadelphia History Museum, a city-owned historic landmark by, among other things, preserving the historic building exterior, which dates back to 1826, increasing exterior security, and repurposing the museum's garden to a multi-purpose education and performance space. And $2.4 million to the Free Library of Philadelphia to make a Redevelopment Assistance Capital Program grant 
that will launch the 21st Century Libraries Initiative that will result in the renovation of every neighborhood library. The funding will allow for construction uh, that will begin simultaneously on four branches, providing for a handicap accessible, um, uh, a mix of private and communal spaces that will allow patrons to take full advantage of the library's health care, educational, and job search resources and an improved children's space and newly designated teen areas. We are taking this action now because of a requirement in the Home Rule Charter concerning amendments to the capital program. Before council can enact an amendment to the capital program of this nature, we must first request through the mayor the recommendations of the City Planning Commission. The commission has 30 days in which to respond with its recommendations. So I want to start, we want to start the clock running now. Do the council members present have copies of the proposed amendments? I believe they were just given to you. Um, thank you. Co Councilman Good will offer these amendments. Uh, we will not be requesting a vote on the amendments. Our intent is to get these amendments in the record. We will now briefly recess, as I said before, our public hearing and go into a public meeting for the purpose of introducing these amendments into the official record. Chair recognizes Councilman Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I offer the proposed amendments to bills numbers 140144, 140145, and request that no vote be taken on them at this time. Thank you, Councilman. We'll see that the stenographer receives a copy of both amendments so that they may be part of the record. We will now go into our, back into our public hearing, and today we'll hear testimony from city departments, the Revenue Department, Board of Vision and Taxes, Revenue t uh, and on revenue tax bills, and later today on, we will have public testimony. Um, our first department is Department of Revenue. Commissioner and whoever else. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Councilman. Please uh, proceed. Where I know will be your. Uh, Summarize testimony, and then we'll have questions. Okay. <laughs> Good morning to uh, our chair, Councilman Greenlee, and members of the uh, city council. Uh, I am Clarina Tolson, chief collection officer and uh, revenue commissioner. The following testimony provides an overview of the Department of Revenue's fiscal 15 operating budget and our strategies and goals. The mission of the Revenue Department is to optimize the collection of revenue to provide funding for schools and services, assuring that everyone pays their fair share while assisting those in need of financial assistance. Our goal is to create a culture of compliance by sending strong, clear messages that the city cannot subsidize businesses and individuals at the expense of children and citizens. The major strategies we have employed to support our efforts in meeting our mission include improved customer service, supporting those in financial need, creating stronger consequences for noncompliance, building partnerships to enhance collection activities, promoting early action on delinquency, providing greater education to the public and business community, integrating technology to improve efficiencies and effectiveness. Over the last year, we have seen progress on many fronts. I offer a few highlights, not to say they are where they should be, but that we're making great strides in making that very quickly. Uh, to highlight several key collection results as compared to last fiscal year, total school income tax is up 104 percent. Delinquent school income tax collections have increased by 275 percent. Total liquor tax is up 23 percent. Delinquent liquor collections has increased by 200 percent. Delinquent use and occupancy collections has increased by 29 percent. There's been a 38 percent increase in total uh, delinquent collections for the school district. Delinquent real estate collections are up 22 percent. And last year for the calendar year 13, we achieved a rate that is our highest in, in a couple of decades, which is a 94 percent collection rate for our real estate. The department continues to meet organizational goals such as NBC participation and promoting diversity in our workplace with an executive staff of uh, one half minority and close to the same for women. We are proud of our workplace inclusion. Our MWDB participation is also expected to exceed 50 percent. Relative to some of our initiatives, both past and current, 
A centerpiece of our uh, collection activity is the revocation of the commercial activity licenses for those businesses that have been delinquent in their business taxes. Though we certainly never want to have to close a business, it ultimately is um, the only leverage that we may have to use for some businesses who will not become complying in any other way. Uh, in less than one year, we have uh, collected over $20 million uh, in cash for this, through this program. An additional $7.5 million is committed in payment agreements also through this program. Included in those funds are $6.5 million for liquor, um, $6.3 million for BERT, and $2.3 million for wage tax. You'll note that that 6.5 is dedicated to the school district funding. The other uh, significant program that we have uh, for collections is an innovation with regard to sequestration or receivership. This is a program that existed uh, some 30 years ago, but has been revived in a slightly different manner, where we, uh, we have point appointed receivers to collect rental income and to operate um, delinquent businesses or properties until the taxes are paid. Uh, we presently have 244 active petitions filed with the court, and since October when this program first started, so it is very much in its infancy, uh, $4.1 million has been collected for the program. Uh, another tool that you're quite familiar with uh, on collections is sheriff sales, <coughs> and that continues to be an effective tool. Uh, our average number of all properties placed in the sheriff sale uh, process by our legal unit, our law unit, and co-counsel has increased from 354 uh, per month in fiscals 11 and 12 to 1,065 per month for fiscals 13 and 14. The department continues to build uh, strong partnerships, and over the last several months, we've built a closer relationship with the state, and we have received information from them that will enable us to identify taxpayers that will owe, uh, could owe significant uh, school income tax, as well as other taxes as we continue to do um, our audits and discovery. Uh, this will only add to our success that we've seen in some of our other initiatives and, uh, and increase our collection rates. In terms of new uh, initiatives, our cashing and remittance system and our comprehensive data warehouse is still underway. We're well into implementation of the cashiering system and the final stage of selecting a vendor or starting with a vendor uh, to develop the uh, integrated data warehouse. We have selected a vendor. We are developing a more integrated outreach and communication strategy additionally. Uh, that will uh, increase our uh, presence in community meetings. And in fact, we are regularly now going out to uh, meet with uh, community groups, uh, certainly at the request sometimes of elected officials, but also uh, upon our own pursuit of opportunities to discuss uh, assistance programs and also uh, filing requirements. We are happy to provide uh, clearer and more informative uh, hand uh, products uh, brochures and pamphlets, as well as continuing to improve our website uh, and use of technology such as uh, the virtual town hall meetings, uh, branding, and other technological improve improvements. Uh, there will be a new water bill design that's going to be in effect uh, in another two, much, two months, which will make it easier for customers to interpret uh, information that has been provided to them. The budget proposed here allows the department uh, to uh, engage its mission of revenues for schools and services. Therefore, we request your favorable consideration of the budget and uh, ask, uh, say that I am available for any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you for all the work you do over here, uh, in, the, in your second stint as a commissioner after the streets department and uh, I think it's fair to say that we've seen a tremendous improvement in the collection since you've been the commissioner and uh, so you certainly deserve a lot of credit for it because as you pointed out uh, all this money besides being due it goes to either a one of the city departments that make the city run better or to the school district and we obviously all know uh, how much the school district needs additional funding so um, but on that note, as you talk about collection rates up in, in all those various taxes, uh, how much more than the budgeted revenue is expected to be received by the city and the school district in FY14 due to this collection increase? Do you have such a figure? 
Uh, I don't know that we can say that, uh, I can say at this time how much more we expect past what has been budgeted. Um, our budget goals are, are very challenging. Uh, we have, um, with our real estate taxes, which is a, which is a significant uh, elephant in the room, uh, we're still working through the process with regard to uh, final billing for people as they go through appeals. Uh, we're, we're seeing very strong performances on many of our taxes, but I'm not uh, prepared as yet to estimate where we will wind up ultimately. Okay, so it's still all being calculated, I guess. All being yeah. calculated yeah. And, okay. and some very strong uh, performances, but also some challenges. Okay, I got you. And, and speaking of the elephant in the room, the real estate taxes, uh, I know we've, uh, in talking to the council president, we've heard a lot of examples in his district, and I'm sure in others, where um, people have paid loop payment, they're eligible for it, they paid it, but um, the record is still showing, um, uh, what would you call it, delinquency costs, uh, be, even though they paid the amount they're supposed to pay. Is that just kind of a computer glitch, or are you still catching up with that? Or We, we are in collaboration with um, OPA. We uh -huh. are finalizing the certifications for all of our uh, properties that have applied for LOOP. And we expect that uh, over the next three to four weeks that that will be finalized so people's records will accurately reflect the, their uh, involvement in the process. Okay. So you're, you're saying as soon as it's verified that they, they were eligible, then that um, uh, cost will be, t the interest will be taken off the Absolutely. record? Absolutely. Uh, okay. their, their participation is, is clear. However, the records uh, are computer records mm -hmm. and files that may be viewed on the web are not uh, up to date as yet. So we are still in the process of doing the formal, I'll say, um, programming to provide those uh, accurate certifications. And once that is done, everyone's record uh, will okay. be clear. Okay. And any interest and penalties that have been added will be automatically deducted without okay. any discussion. Right. Yeah, that, that's important because obviously people are real estate tax, particularly the people who were uh, eligible for LOOP, it's a significant savings for them. And then when they see they're being charged interest, they, they, they get a little upset. So, yes. you know, and call folks like us. So, uh, no, I appreciate that. And it, again, time frame, what was that? It, it should be long? within three to four weeks. Three to four weeks, great. Thank you. And uh, I, should, I should say, Councilman, yes. I think that, um, you know, at, this is in tandem with your earlier comment about how we were performing, that we have a, a team of folks who are taking to heart the, the need to have a, uh, uh, a legitimate, incredible, and fair system. And they appreciate and understand their role in government mm -hmm. to support our citizens uh, in a fair process. Uh, fair doesn't always feel good, uh, but we try to make it fair. And certainly uh, with the spirit of cooperation with council, but also the spirit of cooperation with our citizens, we will try to alleviate as many problems that we may cause, mm -hmm. such as you know, not being able to uh, maybe in a more timely manner uh, adjust our computer records. Mm -hmm. But we are catching up with that process. It's the first time doing this uh, with Loop, um, and uh, the staff that is uh, working on it has been working on all cylinders, mm -hmm. in addition to working on other programs as well. But we, uh, it's important to us, and we will adjust it. And we don't want anyone to feel that uh, they will not get the credit that they deserve. Okay, thank you. And I, I can say, I think a lot of us feel this way. We have confidence in, in the job you're doing there, Commissioner. Um, Chair recognized Councilman Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. First, congratulations on the increases in collections. Uh, otherwise, we're just actually looking for an update on the CDC tax credit program. I know recently there were open slots. I'm wondering how many were filled. The CDC tax credit program? One second, sir. One second, sir. We'll give you that data. Uh, the question is how question. many? There were recently open slots. How many of those slots were filled? Yeah, okay. Five new slots are open because of expiration of the first 10 years. Sir, so, before you go further, could you just identify yourself for the record? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. My name is Telahona Fasa. I'm the Director of Policy in the Revenue Department. Okay, thank you. Uh, five new slots are open, and we have received seven new applications for the five new slots. 
So there's seven new applications for the five slots, but none of the, but those slots are not filled yet. Not yet. So what happened is out of the seven, six were received timely because it is first come, first served basis. So the six are going to be considered, and out of the six, four of them are CDCs, and two of them are intermediaries. So basically the four are already in it without any lottery pick. So the two intermediaries are received in the same day, so you decide we, between them. Yes. So one of the two will be in based on the first thing is review of their application. If both of them qualify under the intermediary uh, qualification, then one will be picked based on the lottery okay. system. Are there any other open slots at this time other than the five? Not yet. Okay. Uh, when will new slots open up and how many? I don't have the numbers at this point, but they are more or less on a yearly basis. The ones which have been there for the last 10 years will expire and then we'll have the same process. We open it up for new applicants and then we will go through that process when so the time comes. So do we know how many total partnerships there are at this time? 42, including the two healthy initiative credits, the health credit. So th we have 42 so in, in that credit program. So in terms of pending applications, there will be one application that was late? There is one application which has some problems we're trying to resolve it. Once that is done, maybe that, that particular participant, if that participant is out, then we will advertise it again for one slot, and then that will, that will. And there's one non-prop intermediary that will lose out? Yes. So there, there are potentially two applicants that won't have slots? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilman. Um, in the detail, there's an appropriation for about $32,000 for a parking tax study. Can you detail a little bit of what that uh, purpose of that study is? Yes, Councilman. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were uh, in collaboration with uh, a, the, I'm not, I'm not sure the exact name, but Parking Association. Mm -hmm. um, they shared with us a, a study that had been done uh, on their behalf, right. uh, which included a lot of uh, parking uh, lots or garages where they had concerns about um, whether or not these locations were paying taxes. We did an investigation of each and every one of those to find out where the problem was. And, and unfortunately, a lot of it was that there was not, well, I shouldn't say not unfortunately, from their perspective, the garages were in compliance, were in compliance. So they were in them, compliance. many okay. of them, most of them were in compliance. Mm. Uh, as a follow up to that, though, we had a separate um, study done, or we're having a separate study done that is uh, evaluating our parking lots to try to do some audits for us to tell us where might it be best for us to allocate our resources for um, uh, additional audits uh, and assessments of activity. Uh, so there's a private firm that's going to go through and do some uh, work for us in that state. Mm. It is interesting because w I remember sitting here and hearing that testimony that there was all these parking uh, lots not paying money, but um, you found that that, for the most part, was not accurate, is that? That's correct. It okay. was not accurate. Okay. But we did, we did investigate each and every one. Okay. Thank you. All right. Just one other thing. You t Talking about staffing vacancies, um, uh, you say in your written testimony, uh, 96 staff vacancy, uh, out of the current 96 budgeted staffing vacancies, 74 will be filled by the end of the fiscal year? Yes, that? correct. Okay. Are there plans on hiring the other additional? Yes, plan? sir. Oh, yes, okay. sir. Uh, but we are, we are absolutely certain that those will happen in short order, probably within the next few weeks. Okay. Um, and the others are, are, are important and critical. On the plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Councilwoman Bass. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Good morning. Ma How are you? Very good, thank you. Good, good. I have a question for you about um, the Conservatorship Act and um, the fact that 
uh, it, it's, it was developed to be a tool to be helpful to our communities to address properties that are blighted, that are neglected, that people seemingly have pretty much walked away from. And so, um, you know, we've had a great success with some uh, properties. And then we've had, you know, for example, ORC uh, in the West Oak Lane section has done great work uh, through the conservatorship laws. But uh, we have some situations now where other nonprofits that are trying to duplicate that to improve their community and to uh, get rid of these blighted properties through, you know, you know, repabbing them and getting them back on the market and getting a family into the neighborhood. Um, one of the problems we've had is that we've seen a push uh, from revenue to push those properties into sheriff sale. And so I wanted to see what we could do or what your thoughts were about that and is there a way that we could avoid that from happening because it basically holds up the process of, um, you know, keeping this property well, or getting this property uh, into the hands of a family, someone in the neighborhood, a property improved, greatly improved, improvement for the entire community. Yes. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman. I think that um, as a department, we are, uh, we are refining our perspective with regard to our involvement with not just collections, but with other um, public policy issues. Mm -hmm. And certainly this one with regard to how a vacant property is used, right. we understand that we have a role in that and, yes. and to support it. Uh, uh, in particular, I think that the use of the uh, uh, sheriff sales, a process to force a property to mm -hmm. uh, hopefully viable use is one that we use when all else fails with regard to uh, property owner payment of taxes. Uh, I think that our, our need is to work closely with council okay. and with others to make sure that we're properly managing some of our, the properties mm -hmm. so that we can avoid sheriff sale but not instead allow even community groups to hold property that's vacant no, or blighted. Right. Uh, so sometimes um, I think that we've got to be clear, maybe to council, a little clear to council about how we are um, scheduling things, but maybe they will not be as fast-tracked as others will be fast-tracked. But on the same hand, they're on the schedule such that if a group falls down or does not right. do what they need to do to a property, we will be in position to move on it. That would be great if there was some way to have, uh, you know, some checks in place so that um, before revenue decided to move on um, a particular piece of property, maybe checking in with the council office who would know if there's, you know, something going on with it. Or, um, you know, there are different ways to find out if, the, if you know, if, if there's been uh, conservatorship applied to this particular property, I'm sure. So um, whatever ways that we can do that, it really would uh, help us speed up the process and um, you know, make sure that we get this property addressed, which in many times has been vacant for a very long, long time, and people want to see something done, and it yes. really could uh, spur some economic development in the neighborhood. So um, I'm really glad to hear that your office is willing to work on that. Yes. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman Tasca? Very briefly. Thank you sir, very much for uh, uh, the work you're doing, and I really appreciate uh, uh, your office and your um, concern about what happens in the neighborhoods. And I just want to piggyback on what Councilwoman Bass said about the conservatorship program. Uh, I have the famous Lakeys on Stenton Avenue. Um, we couldn't, very difficult dealing with that property. It went to share sale, and they're still not, it's just still sitting there. So they may be paying the taxes, but if we could have gotten it under conservatorship, then Ork could have done something with it. Yes. You know, as we did with the old parties on Ogons Avenue. So it's important, and I appreciate the fact that you want to collaborate with us because, you know, we're there every day in the neighborhood. We know what's going on. We know the groups. And then um, we can uh, develop a plan, an action plan that would, at the end of the day, um, get rid of the blighted property and, and benefit the neighborhood. So that's very important. Other the tax. The tax collection just can't be the end all to be all what is going to happen to the building or the house or whatever. That, um, that, uh, and what impact will the action take it will impact on the neighborhood. So I appreciate your um, uh, willingness to work with us because it's very important. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Okay, seeing so no further questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for all Thank you've you. done. 
Our next, are they ready? Yeah, okay. Our next department is uh, the Board of Revision of Taxes. Good morning. Good morning. Please identify yourself for the record and my, proceed. Yes, my name is Carla Pagan, Executive Director of the Board of Revision of Taxes. Um, here today to testify on the 2015 operating bu fiscal year operating budget. Morning. Um, and I know you all have our summary, so I yes. would like to address questions. But before I go into questions, I just want to share with you our main accomplishments of the year. Um, since the council bill passed last month, our appeal hearings have increased from about three to five sessions a week to 14 sessions a week. So that's good news to report. And we're hearing approximately 660 cases a week that we were before at 150 a week. So that's good news. Um, so I'm pleased to report that the appeal volume, we're moving it down much quicker than before. Okay. That's very short and sweet. Thank you. Yes. Um, <laughs> on that same vein, um, uh, in on the, in the written testimony, you state department requests an additional 93,000 for FY15 to finish a hearing the appeals caseload. Yes. Uh, is that increase expected to be sufficient to hear the, uh, the increase of appeals? Or? Yes, most of the increase that we got in the 2014 budget to hear the appeals, um, we spent bulking up our supplies and getting some new equipment. It's the class 100 funds that we may need additional money for fiscal year 15 just to help cover temporary staff employees. Mm, okay. And what's the expected timetable to finish? I mean, do you have a target time? Now we hope to be finished residential appeals at least by Labor Day at the very latest Labor December. Day? Mm -hmm. Yes, and then go right in. We're hearing certain commercial industrial cases now, um, but yeah, the goal is to have all residential cases heard and decided at least by the end of September. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us, I'm just interested in this, on, on the, the appeals that have been heard so far, um, are the, the people coming in with uh, arguments based basically on the market value, or is it kind of uh, based on different things, like I've lived here so long and I shouldn't have to pay more taxes kind of thing? I'm just trying to feel, you know, the, feel out the, yeah. the basis of the appeals. And it really depends on what part of the city we're hearing that day, but it seems okay. that um, most are actually arguing about value, but not that they disagree that the sales on their block have been that value, but perhaps they're arguing that their house is not to the condition that the high sale houses are from. So they do want to be lowered because they've been there 50 years, and they mm -hmm. might not have the central air or the rehab kitchens and bathrooms. Well, that's okay. certainly a legitimate argument, right? Yes, yeah. right. Okay. Right. okay, that's the kind of thing I'm getting at. And that, you may have said this, I'm sorry. How many appeals have been heard to date, do you know? So we've heard about 6,000 to date. 6,000, really? Yes. Okay. And the average daily caseload is how many? I'm sorry, you might have said this. So with the increase in our hearing session now, right. um, two days a week we spend doing all non-oral cases where the board has done their prep work and we're putting those decisions on record. And then three days of the week, we're hearing a combination of oral cases and non-oral cases. Um, so total, it comes to 14 sessions and about 600 cases a week. Mm -hmm. So that 600 is comprised of about 300 oral and another 300 non-oral cases. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are just putting in non-oral non -oral, uh, requests? Uh, it seems that we had, a, we had several thousand non-oral appeals, yes. Mm -hmm. And it seems that now that tax bills have gone out, the homestead, they can see the change. Um, some people have even got loop applications right. granted. They don't want to come in or they just want the board to review it for administrative review and make a decision. Or maybe even drop the appeal. Or appeal, even withdraw yeah. their appeal, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Right, thank you. Councilman Jones? Well, he was here. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, sir. A um, couple of quick questions, sure. and um, thank you for the daunting task your department did with uh, the whole AVI issue. One of the quick questions I would have is on tangled title issues. 
uh, which uh, in some of our older communities, what happens is grandmom had the house. Um, one of the children inherited, did not do the paperwork, and now they're in the third generation of ownership. And that has caused a great deal of angst uh, and also complications by way of relief efforts and things like that. Have you experienced that, A? And what are some of the remedies for that for the public? And I kind of know, but I, I'd like you to put it out there. Yes. Um, we do experience that at the board hearing level also. But since taxpayers come in and testify on record who they are and what the relation is to the property, the board is much more lenient to letting them testify. Um, so we do go in detail on our website who can actually file an appeal. So all those issues of tangled title are included. So there's no restrictions to them filing an appeal or coming before the board for oral hearing session or non-oral. So it's actually, if you do have a tangled title situation, it's much easier to file an appeal than for maybe your homestead application. And so we're now beginning to, you know, people kind of didn't believe AVI yeah. <clears throat> would ever happen. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people did not receive, even though we did billboards, went door to door, did mailings, they still refused to believe that this would ever someday come to be. Yes. Um, is your office still open to doing workshops, which you did in the beginning, going out and talking to the public about, you know, one-on-one -on -one issues dealing with individual households and individual appeals and individual assessments? Yes, we are open. It does seem, though, as people that period, since the appeal filing deadline is before the tax bill arrives at someone's home, that learning curve is mostly addressed either at the hearing or before it actually comes to a hearing. So before when the eight first AVI notices went out, you know, it's question marks and no one knows how to respond or what it really means. So then as tax bills went out, people could see their homestead, loop applications came through, they were accepted and granted. By the time they get to the hearing, most people are informed. Or if they were in denial, once they got their tax bill, there was a sudden realization. So we'll see a lot of those people in the hearing room between now and the end of the year. Um, we do have a high number of what we call nunk pro tunk petitions where people filed late even after 30 days after they got their tax bill. So we will continue to hear those arguments from people, even in the 2015, those late appeal filers. So a lot of their questions usually get answered during the appeal process. But yes, we're open to community workshops too. Reason I mention that, particularly um, seniors who may be uh, in a position where they can't get far, uh, don't want to go far, um, need to be, um, in my opinion, accommodated um, particularly in some of our older neighborhoods um, where, where you have a lot of growth activity going on, they're the ill-informed uh, victims of that prosperity. And um, we really need to dig down. And I, I would say that we've done a good first brush of this, mm -hmm. but there are pockets of people, yes. pockets of communities that probably just didn't get the memo. Mm -hmm and uh, we really need to drill down to them. And I will be reaching out to my colleagues to figure out where we can do a second round of those types of outreaches, Mr. Chairman, um, to see if we can't you know, save every, every taxpayer we can. Absolutely. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Bass. Thank you. Hi, Carla. How are you? How are you? <laughs> good, thanks. Good, good. So I have a question for you um, in reference to um, a couple of calls that our office had received from properties that are sort of being taxed um, now that were not, um, <coughs> let me see, how should I say, you know, originally they were nonprofits. Somehow along the way, the city said, you're no longer a nonprofit. We can't find your paperwork. Or, you know, something happened. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly the city no longer recognized that they were a nonprofit and sent them tax bills for the past you know, two, three, four, five, ten years. And um, I noticed that it's, it's happened a number of times, and it seems as if we come to some sort of a settlement where we say, okay, well, you know, the city will take, you know, we'll just, just give us the tax bill for the last couple of years and 
will forget the rest. And so I wanted to see if you had any thoughts on that. I know that we've communicated somewhat about it. Yes, we've, we found that there, a lot of the appeal filings from, are from previously filed, previously properties that had the, non, the nonprofit exemption, mm -hmm. or there may be church parking lots where the tax bill may have been $50 and no one cared about it, mm -hmm. and suddenly it's $800 or $1,800. Okay. So the assessment office has seen a rise of applications for nonprofit real mm -hmm. estate tax status. So once those applications go to the OPA, get processed and approved, if that property owner also has previous years that need to be addressed, mm -hmm. the board does hear those cases that may address 2013, 2012, 2011. And if the board grants that nonprofit exemption from past years, mm -hmm. then their tax bill will be wiped away. Okay. Right. How does it happen, though, that, let's say if I'm, you know, the Cindy Bass Foundation, and have been for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the way, it may have come up that I'm, that you no longer recognize this foundation. How, can you talk a little bit about that or how yes, it works? Yes, we see it happen most commonly. So when there's D changes, so maybe you were the Cindy Bass Foundation, and in 2017 you get new partners and it becomes the Cindy Bass and John Allen Foundation. Okay. Once that new deed is recorded, the, that deed recording goes to the assessment office and they think, oh, there's new ownership. Okay. Let's remove that tax exemption. Okay. So there's some changes in yes. the, the, the formation or the, the, the uh, recognition of the organization. Yes. Okay. And even a lot of churches, they could add worship to them in their name, do a new deed, and they lose their nonprofit okay, status. Yeah. So any little change can trigger that sort of issue with the city. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilman O, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, first uh, question is that I see that you are, uh, you have two temporary masters and you're expecting two more. Is that correct? Yes. So we have two masters that just came on board this month. Um, and we actually have interviews for two more this week. Okay. And where do you draw your pool of interviewees from? You know, honestly, I don't know. The board, um, these are all referrals and recommendations that came to the board. So they actually hired the masters, where I hired the other office temporary staff. Do you know what that process is? I mean, in general, do you know what the process is? For temp staff or masters specifically? Or for masters in particular. So for masters, we did have to go, I just, two weeks ago, I went before the Civil Service Commission. Um, to get approval to hire those masters, since, they, since most of them are counsel. Um, and once you get that civil service waiver, then they can come on board to the department to work a temporary term. So our masters will be working a short term of six months each. And uh, must they be uh, licensed attorneys? They don't have to be. The board did consider looking at attorneys, um, even some real estate uh, professionals. What they found is that the attorneys were able to negotiate with the taxpayers better and offer answers to those other questions that weren't necessarily real estate driven. Okay. I, I, I wonder, are there, any, um, are there any employees that uh, <clears throat> are, uh, for example, Latino or Asian American and, and, has the, um, and has your office reached out? <laughs> to those sources? Yeah, we only had one, t our, 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 our normal staff is so small, and the temp staff that came this year was a combination, um, minority, non-minority. We had one Hispanic employee. We've never had an Asian employee, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, in, in the course of the reviewing the appeals, have you found any patterns of neighborhoods that seem to have a lot of um, uh, challenges or, or where it looks like they were overassessed. Yes, there's every year you can clearly see a pattern of the appeal filers based on um, their location in the city. I haven't seen an area that's particularly overassessed um, because the assessments do match the recent sales prices, but 
like Council Member Jones was saying, if that area is comprised of a lot of senior citizens or long-term homeowners, um, they could be feeling the shock more and perhaps their houses are overassessed, not because this, the neighborhood sales don't drive it, but because the condition of their properties are not where the highest sales in the neighborhood are. So yeah, you do see trends in different parts of the city. Uh, could you give us some examples where, you know, there may be high property values based on sales, but the condition of the, the homes are actually rather poor and don't appear to match the values? Do you have areas specifically that you have come across? Sure. Um, perhaps in the Temple University area, there's a lot of long-term owner occupants that have been there, raised their grandchildren there, and then they're living next door to perhaps an owner or landlord or investor that's bought 20 properties in the neighborhood at very low value, rehab 20 of them, and then are experienced very high rental incomes from Temple students. Mm. So you have to make an adjustment for that long-term owner-occupant and the person that's generating a heavy rent roll. And sometimes you know that if people, if the investors took out permits, then you can spot it very easily. And then sometimes you can't tell one homeowner from the other. So right. you, you do want people to appeal to come out and share that with us. So uh, is it possible for your office to share with council, and I'm sure the district council people in particular, any particular neighborhoods where that may be the case so that we are aware of it as it develops? Sure, sure. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. I would think just off the top of my head, an area like Point Breeze would be uh, an area. Yes. I'm familiar with the area of Francisville, which is near me. I would think they would also be areas that would kind of be what Councilman O is talking about there. Well, yes, all the parts of the city that experience the gentrification right. and the housing boom, yes, mm -hmm. they're hit pretty hard. Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Heenan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming in. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to follow up <clears throat> um, on the, the trend, the question of trends. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, could you provide to the chair a list of all the trends, you know, whether uh, that you've dis discovered, you know, through the process of, uh, of your appeals, you know, whether, you know, a certain neighborhood, the, the type of properties, the years of the property, the, you know, is, is it a certain, uh, uh, is it a certain characteristic of, of the property uh, that would you know, be noticeably uh, you know, trending, you know, for the, you know, an increase or a decrease in the property values? Sure. Um, just keep in mind, it's our opinion, um, because we do find that the arguments are similar in some neighborhoods, and that's how we come up with these trends, but sure. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that, that's fine. You know, I mean, I think, uh, I think my colleagues have, have asked okay. a question okay. uh, succinctly, so I appreciate that. Uh, are you keeping... Obviously, you're, you're keeping records of uh, the outcomes of, of all the appeals? Yes, we do have that record. Right. And uh, as this process goes along uh, by the, you know, when you get caught up to date, would they be available? Sure, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you had mentioned the uh, Nung Prung Tung petitions. Yes. How, how many of them? Uh, and uh, I understand why so many, but in, in your... What, what is the reasoning why they are uh, well, petitioning, you know, in that fashion? So usually we might see a couple hundred non-proton petitions yearly just for the people that may have, have ignored their assessment notice and don't even respond until their tax bill comes. So those people have filed again, and that number is probably amplified because their bill is going up much higher this year than in previous years. So a lot of people are saying that maybe they didn't get their mail when that AVI mailing went out. And I don't know how much return mail the OPA had this year. But um, most people say they didn't get copy of that notice. So they're responding based on their tax bill and nothing else. Okay. So and you obviously see a more than average yes. amount of uh, petitions? Yes. Okay. Um, would you be able to 
at a certain can they can they can they file that petition at any time? They can, yes. They can. The petition non pro tunk is simply Latin for now so if I'm filing now for then. So it, it really is a late filed application that you can take at any time. Right. Okay. So at, at a certain point again, uh, would you be able to uh, provide to the chair um, how many, what, what, what the likelihood of, you know, the, uh, uh, the amount that was successful in, in their petition yes. for, for appeal and uh, the cost for uh, the BRT time and any kind of uh, legal expenses that, it, that occurred through you know, throughout the whole process? Yes. Which is an ongoing process, I understand. Yes, it will be. Uh, my last question uh, is, uh, I had a couple constituents who, because of the backlog uh, with, with OPA, they, uh, they didn't have a, a, a response, you know, to their, uh, to their first level review. And by time, uh, they did hear some, some kind of response. They had the appeal uh, from BRT, and then they have two um, different, and quite different, in, in some cases drastic, uh, in the amount of like $15,000 apart, uh, two different types of uh, conclusions. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, it, it just brings up kind of questions on, on how we, you know, are, are we doing something different you know, when, you, when you're uh, taking a look at the reassessment from the BRT as from o OPA, or, I mean, are they supposed to be similar or off of uh, uh, national standards? And I know we've heard that over and over and over again, mm -hmm. you know, but what we haven't heard uh, up until this point is how you're getting two conflicting um, conclusions. Okay, so first I want to say, um one different thing the board is doing this year for those people that had first level review applications that weren't decided by our filing deadline we did accept those appeals that were technically late but we took them in as timely um, and when people got those decisions some were reduced but then they said they still want to keep a board appeal open because they wanted a further reduction um, but Usually what we've seen is that the board's decisions typically come close to perhaps what the first level review application may have. And if not, the board is typically lower. Um, sometimes the taxpayer may send zero to a couple of supporting documents with their first level review. And perhaps if that got denied or just reduced not to their satisfaction, they may have sent additional documents in for their hearing or presented new testimony that would support a further reduction. So that's usually how that may happen. But from what we've seen, we've been, the board's usually pretty close. Okay, so if, if we happen to have a situation like that, we just contact uh, one of the two, I guess, the later, uh, yes, the latter so if you of, run into of, that, the, uh, of, of the appeals? Yes, I would say contact us because um, the board did also agree that if in fact a board decision comes in higher than a late decision on a first level review that the board would, they wouldn't override a lower value and they would accept the lowest decision. Perfect. That's right. all, that's all I so it's the benefit to the homeowner. A right. Absolutely. Yes. And going through the fair, fair yes, process it's only fair. that, that, that right. they've uh, have experienced. Great. Yes. Thank you for your time. Sure. I have no further questions. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's actually a follow-up to Councilman O's line of questioning. I just thought of a few questions. Uh, how long have you been at BRT? I've been with the city seven years. So I was with the old BRT before the new BRT. So the new BRT has been around since 2010. Yeah, I'm, I'm speaking of the old BRT. So since 2007, seven okay. years. Mm -hmm. uh, so the old BRT used to administer the tax abatement program? Yes, and they still do. Well, now it's the OPA. Correct. Okay. Um, but the old BRT used to administer directly. Yes. And when the old BRT was administering that program, did you find that it was impacting the assessment process, particularly for properties that were in close proximity to tax abated properties? 
was the driving of assessments under the old BRT? No, I wouldn't say so. Um, and if it did drive assessments, it wasn't the abatement program that drove the assessments. It's that people were renovating properties, taking them from nominal or low value and then rehabilitating them so their values uh, do I'm actually not speaking of tax abated properties, but properties that are in close proximity to tax abated properties. Well, so yes and no. Um, sales are the, is the number one factor that changes value. So if those... Now, now it does. Well, it was <laughs> back then, too. It should have, that's how it always should be. That's how it should have been. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not questioning whether it was that way or not. I'm, I'm actually trying to actually start a discussion of pre-OPA and post-OPA in terms of the impact of tax abatement on assessments. I'm trying to have an honest discussion about that. And so, so under the old BRT, mm -hmm. uh, were values greatly impacted by the tax abatement program if you were in proximity to a tax abated property? So then I'd have to say no. Under the new BRT, are properties greatly impacted uh, by being in proximity to a tax abated property? So under OPA's AVI, um, if those abated properties have sold, then yes. Okay. So is there a difference in the appeal process between the old BRT and the new BRT in terms of uh, whether you take into consideration how the tax abatement program um, has impacted the assessment of properties that are in proximity to tax abated properties? So no, there's no new appeal process regarding that piece. Um, and the values of non-abated properties in close proximity to abated properties um, typically would not impact value unless there's actually a sale of them. So did properties in proximity to tax abated properties receive an extra jump post OPA? Pre-AVI? <laughs> post AVI. So post AVI, I would probably say yes, if that abated property sold. So if it was one of those abatement programs where it was rehabbed and then sold to a new homeowner, mm -hmm. then yes. If it was one of those abatements where I was the homeowner and put a new addition on the back but never sold my house, then no. So I'm just curious, and just for the record, uh, is that taken into consideration all in terms of the appeal process now? Yes. So when the board looks at people's appeals, and perhaps they may have all of us on the same street. I've been in my house for 60 years, old kitchen. Maybe you bought your house a couple months ago, rehabbed with a 10-year tax abatement. And then there's someone in the middle. Um, the board does look at the range of values of all those property types. Same properties, same block, um, different conditions. So they should be within a range. And the board does consider that low range and high range. And how many situations have you come upon in terms of appeals so far? Well, that, that's one of those trends maybe that we went over before. It happens a lot where in those neighborhoods that have seen a lot of sales or a lot of gentrification or improvement of real estate. And what's generally happening in terms of the first review by OPA? Or are, they, are they taking that into consideration? Because when I question them about it, they say they don't take into consideration whether there is an abated property uh, close to it when they do the initial assessment. But they don't say what, they did not say what they do upon first review in terms of whether they take into consideration then. Uh, I doubt that they do, but I can't speak for them. And so the question is, is the BRT taking that into consideration? Does that affect and change your position on whether you generally accept what OPA does in terms of first review? Well, I'm going to go back a minute. Um, 
the abatement is not the real driver. It's not that driving factor. It's the sale. Um, whether you have an abatement or not. It's the actual sale. Um, so that's probably why the OPA is saying it wasn't a factor that it would impact AVI. It shouldn't, unless that. I, I, I get that. Question is, what is, what's BRT doing in terms of appeals on properties that uh, were not necessarily at full value before uh, AVI, uh, were not necessarily impacted by the tax abatement program in the same way, uh, but are impacted by the tax abatement program through sales, uh, is the board taking that into consideration on appeals? Yes. So again, the board will look at a range. Um, one of the very useful reports that the board has before going into a hearing or when they're reviewing cases, for short we just call it the block report, but it, it allows you to see every single house on a block, the recent sales on the block, and it also gives the condition codes, interior and exterior, and also the building square feet and land square feet. So then the board can easily see, oh, this house here sold for half a million, it was abated. The house next door, maybe the taxpayer sent in photos, that old kitchen, old bath, no recent sales. Um, they, can, they can see that range of value. So yes, they take that in consideration. And, and so OPA probably has higher revenue estimates based upon their assessments than will be realized after the appeals on those properties. Is that fair to say? I don't know. If, so yes, it's a fair statement. I don't know if OPA makes those projections or is it generating more from the finance department with the OPA. Um, but yes, I know there okay. is an allowance made for appeals. So I guess the number, I guess the question I'm asking in the end is, are we going to lose money on appeals because people are finally taking into consideration uh, how assessments are impacted by proximity to tax abated properties that are sold? So will the city lose money on appeals? There will be a difference. Um, with the taxable dollar value of all the assessments on record now versus the taxable va uh, value of the dollar of assessments after 2014 uh, appeal uh, hearing season is done. Okay. O OPA says that it has not yet taken into consideration uh, proximity to tax abated properties yet. Uh, they said that they uh, have experience uh, and will look toward that in the future. Um, to what extent is the BRT taking that into consideration uh, in terms of the impact of tax abated properties uh, on properties that are in close proximity? So and, and, and are, are there any numbers associated with that? There's no numbers, but when someone does appeal, they take, in all, they take in all the factors into consideration, um, or at least the factors that their person is appealing about. Maybe it's because they live next door to a house that's sold for a whole lot more than theirs is worth, and it has a tax abatement. So maybe their argument's non-uniformity. Um, so the board will make that consideration, and they'll look at the numbers. May, or maybe it's just simply condition. So it's, I hear you saying the impact of the abatement on the values, but the abatement's just a piece that may drive a bigger picture. So it's not the abatement that's impacting the neighbor's property. It's the abatement it, that caused the overvaluing of the property that's impacting it upon sale. Of the abated property or the house next door? Both. On the abated property, yes. And on the house next door, yes, if it's a sale on the block, if that abated property has sold. See, see, Councilman O was asking about the sticker shop created in those situations. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking whether there's any analysis being done in terms of how the finance department might have fallen short because of what's going to happen on appeal. 
and, and if there's and, and I understand how to some extent that conversation is not supposed to be had mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in terms of finance department projections and DRT appeals. Yes. I'm asking, does anyone know the number or projection? Is, is, is Someone any employed by the city knows the number. <laughs> okay. I don't know that number. Um, but that, you know, I know that number is looked at yearly. What the tax roll is off assessments and what that factor is for appeals. Yeah. So I'm speaking specifically about appeals related to those properties in proximity to tax abated properties that cause the property to be overvalued and then sold at a higher price than it should have. So that's not specifically looked at because so when I hear you say cause the neighboring property to be overvalued, um, well perhaps. So the house next door shouldn't be at the same value as a newly rehabbed abated property. But yes, the house next door's value will increase. So if I'm the worst house on my block, the value of my house will still rise if the sales on my block are going up, even if I live on the worst house. One more question, Mr. Chair. Okay. Councilman Jones already giving me dirty looks, but that's okay. <laughs> um, the, the question simply is, so from the way the board is approaching this, is it safe to say that those long-term homeowners won't feel the full impact until they sell their own properties? Long-term owners are, are going to feel impact if the values, the, the sales prices have risen in their neighborhood. Yes, they will. Um, if the prices are rising in your neighborhood, you're going to feel the impact. What we're hearing is, oh, great, and this is why they're so ecstatic about Loop. Um, so Loop was a solution or a remedy or help for them. Yes, but sure, long-term property owners will feel it more. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Jones? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your timekeeper's prompt. <laughs> I, I saw the looks you were giving no, over here, Councilman. Yeah, yeah. All right. That's all right. Quick question. <laughs> sure. um, number one, on my colleague's line of questioning, it's just my theory, and I, I remember asking in these chambers, to figure out what the actual process it was that they were using. And you had to have a master's in math, advanced math in order to understand it. But in layperson's term, if you have 10 houses on a block, three of them get abatements, and they put in $200,000 worth of improvements, mm -hmm. the tipping point is not at the point of the sale where people start to speculate and start to pick up two or three houses in anticipation of getting that kind of profit windfall that comes when a neighborhood is viewed as up and coming. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is look at what once was North Philly and is now Brewery Town, mm -hmm. or look at parts of uh, uh, you know neighbor neighboring areas in North Philly. Uh, uh, up and around. Um, I'm always going to mention Francisville, Council. No, I wasn't going to do you like that. <laughs> but there are plenty of these examples where these abatements do have a immediate impact, even before sale, because people see the investment going into into the area and say, "Oh, it's hot." Now, one would argue one way or another if that's a good thing, but the impact, the unintended consequence to the neighbor living next door, is dramatic. We've had people come from around the city and show us you know, that they bought that property 40 years ago and now are you know, faced with a tax bill that is more than the original amount of the house. So w w whether the chicken or the egg, which one came first, the impact is still the same to them, whether it's a point of sale or a point of abatement. And I think I would agree with my colleague that it has a dramatic impact. So that wasn't my question, but just my observation going through this. The question I have is we went through AVI and we went and did we, question, mm -hmm. examine 90 percent of the properties actually or, or would you claim 100 percent or? When you say examine. 
reassessed, revalued, actual valued, whichever you like. As far as I know, yeah, the I mean, OPA not, this is not a court of law. reassessed the entire city. Okay. So yes. now my question becomes, mm -hmm. at what point in time are we going to attempt to do that again, or is there a different methodology that will be employed neighborhood by neighborhood, sporadic sales by, what is your next phase of this to keep track of what the actual values are? So I don't know. Um, that's an OPA that's question. Answer. Yes. The OPA will set that plan for the city. All right. They, didn't, they haven't talked to you to give you a sense of, here we go again, it's get ready to happen, gear up <laughs> kind of thing? We know it's not happening for 2015. So I think everyone took a, ah, a sigh of relief. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see about 16, but 16 conversations have not, you know, nothing solidified yet. Because uh, one good model in the criminal justice thing, they have a CJAB where the DA knows what the police captain, uh, what the police commissioner is doing, the police commissioner knows what the prison commissioner is doing, the prison commissioner knows what the uh, defense attorneys are doing because one impacts the other. Yes. Similarly, yes. you guys need to talk to each other so that if I need to ramp up my staff to deal with appeals or you know, get, you know, hire a different type of personnel to deal with um, the actions of another department. That's a good model for you guys to follow um, so that everyone is aware of yes. the impacts of decision one department to another. So we do talk with the OPA a lot. Um, we work very closely together. So yes, what they put out directly impacts what our production will be for the following year. Um, and they do share that with us. And then our computer systems are so closely linked. So we do communicate. Yes. So when you're in that room again, <laughs> ask them when they, okay. what their methodology is going to be okay. so that you can anticipate, so that we can anticipate the fallback of this. Because okay. in some neighborhoods, it's a lot more drastic than others. And um, you know, fortunately, everybody wasn't impacted. Second part of that question is, in that second round, a lot in, in my district, I believe the figure was 69% of the homes either stayed the same or even went down. Okay. And that's fine. Everybody didn't have that experience. No. But if, if, if it means that the second swing when you come back around, that sticker shock now hits the other group, we need to be prepared for that as well. So yes. that methodology is critically important to us. It took us, what, damn near 20, a decade to get our heart up to do this one. And, and, and the, the tremors and shocks have been felt around the city. Mm -hmm. So any anticipation of that kind of thing so that we can learn from the first time yes. um, would be helpful. Okay. You'll probably know before me, though, I bet. Uh, <laughs> all right. I look forward to that. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chairman. Sure. Councilman. Uh, Councilman O. And then Councilman Johnson. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a quick question on Nunc Pro Tunc uh, appeals. Uh, do you know the, are those, um, at, at what rate are those being uh, accepted or as, as legitimate appeals? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> so if the taxpayer simply documents why they're filing their 2014 appeal late, the board will accept that Nunc Pro Tunc petition. Um, and I'll probably know by next spring if the majority of those get granted or not. Okay. I, I, I you know, the, re the reason I ask is because typically, as far as, uh, as far as I'm an attorney, nunc pro trunks are rarely mm. um, approved, you know, because, yes. you know, they typically involve some, uh, you know, uh, situation where a person, they were in a coma, you know, something like that. Right. And, and the reason I, I bring that up is because we get phone calls from people who did not file on time saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to file nunc pro tunc, I'm going to pay this amount of money, mm -hmm. and should I do it? And I did basically, you know, so without really knowing um, if there is a large amount of people that are, you know, paying fees and uh, going ahead and that's going around and people are filing all these nunc pro tunks, which basically are not based on any good reason. Right. Um, we'd like people to know you can file it and you can pay $5,000 or whatever you're paying, $8,000 in some cases, for these nunc pro tunk appeals. 
but the chances of them actually being granted simply because you're late. And I deal with a, a lot of people who don't speak English, and they believe that even though they filed late without any good reason, that by paying a, an attorney that they have a legal basis for getting a, you know, a, a late fi filing reviewed. Well, so the board does, when people come in and ask about non protons, whether they call or email or come in the office, um, we do let them know that no attorney is required, number one, and there's no filing cost. And even the Court of Common Pleas, if you go down there to file a non proton, they will actually offer now, hey, save your $180, $200, and file free at the BRT. So there's no filing cost, and we won't require an attorney. Um, and yes, historically, non protunct petitions typically do get denied. We will find out this uh, spring um, the degree of the board's leniency this year, because, you know, it was a challenging year for the entire city. So without speaking for them, I'm sure the board will show some leniency in granting those petitions. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. I will note for the chair that uh, I, I've come across cases where, you know, clients are being charged five to $7,000 to file mm -hmm. a nunc pro tunc, you know, in court, and that's just a shame. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And uh, oftentimes those people uh, don't have the resources to do that, you know. So it, just before I recognize Councilman Johnson, on that same note, if I, if I would think is possibly, and I know you can't maybe answer this definitively, possibly one of the, the reasons, and I think councilmen, uh, other council people brought this up, we understand OPA, BRT, all that kind of thing. To other people, it's alphabet soup. Yes. Uh, there, are, there were people who thought, even though we tried to get as much uh, knowledge out as possible, that when they filed their initial review, they were filing a BRT review, yes. uh, BRT appeal. Do you think that certainly one of the issues, because we hear it now, is, you know, I didn't know I had to file BRT. I filed for the initial review. And I think they're being honest. I don't think they're trying to get out. So do you think that that could possibly be one of the arguments that will be listened to that maybe is different from other years because of this possible confusion that people could have? You know? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we do ask people, did you file that first level review? Right. Because if you did, we allow them to bypass that nunc pro tunc process. Oh, okay. And then just take their late appeal as though timely filed. Oh, okay, great, yeah. great, okay. And for, again, before I recognize Councilman Johnson, just for the record, uh, we're going to go right through to the uh, revenue tax bills to just so we can keep moving uh, rather than taking a break. I'm sorry, Councilman Johnson. Thank you. How are you doing today? just want to get a, an idea of the it was mentioned that the appeal, well, one, how many appeals have been done thus far um, this year? And two, because of the 1,000% increase, um, give me an idea of what practices that you have um, adjusted to addressing such an increase in value. Yes, so of the 23,000 appeals filed this year, 6,000 have been heard or decided. And I think the piece you may have missed, um, since the bill passed last month, our hearing sessions have gone from three to five per week to 14 a week. So in the past, where we were hearing approximately 150 cases a week, it's closer to 600. So that's good news. Um, so we're hoping to have all residential appeals heard or decided um, by the end of September. End of September. Yes. And just one last thing, and following up on um, Councilman Jones's comment regarding the collaboration between the Board of Revision of Taxes, OPA, and I will even add on um, the Revenue Department. Like, do y'all have weekly meetings where you're all in one room because one affects the other? The other. Not weekly meetings. It Monthly. Bi-weekly? Depend, depending what's happening at the moment, I may be in meetings with the OPA three days a week and then may not see them again for a month. So uh, it depends just, which, you know, what the issues are. Let and, me intervene just for a second. Sure. I'm going to bring up uh, my good constituent from the second councilmanic district, Rebecca. Rebecca? <laughs> uh, can you come on up just for a second? 
on behalf of the administration, just trying to get an understanding of why I know there's a new managing director restructuring under this new administration and you know it, you know it works in some capacity well it works in a variety of different capacities in terms of restructuring how um, that particular component operates so I was, I'm thinking on the financial side and revenue collection all things regarding our taxes how come there isn't a, a more coordinated effort um, between Department of Revenue OPA and the BRT Rebecca Reinhardt budget director um, there is coordination between revenue and OPA. They're both under the finance director. Yes, that's um, So there's definitely coordination. And my understanding is the OPA and BRT do have communications. They yes. have communications, but not weekly, bi-weekly. Is it just based upon the issues that come up? Or like, for instance, the question was asked, when are we going to do another assessment again, mm -hmm. right? So obviously the question here was, we're not going to do it in 2015. Things are, we may see what happens in, in 2016, but if I, and I want to speak for Richard McKeithen because he's not here, but I think he would probably give me a different overview of where he's at or probably more detailed conversation of where mm -hmm. he's at in terms of doing the actual annual assessments. Because he said something totally different when he came up here before regarding how we're going to take a look at doing assessments in the future. So I'm just trying to figure out how do we get all three departments, like really speaking with one voice on this issue, what do you what do you address it based upon what the issue? I mean, is? the BRT is a uh, separately elected yes. office. Um, yes. Rob wants to. Come on, Rob. <laughs> and I know it's separate, but you know, as a result of AVI, and I'm probably one of the people that can speak from experience. You know, we've seen the impact significantly throughout the second councilmatic district. Right. And the calls we get are pretty much, in some ways, interconnected. Yeah, and I think, and Carla can correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's constant communication mm -hmm. between OPA and, and Carla. I think they work very closely together. Yes. It's, you know, Richie and Mike Piper, yeah. I think you meet pretty regularly. I don't know that it's a scheduled weekly meeting, okay. but I think they're in contact, in contact. all the time. Um, and I think, there's constant um, interaction between OPA and revenue. I don't think that that kind of communication exists or really should exist, needs to exist between BRT and revenue. Okay. So I think that's kind of how that okay. plays and out. So in terms of the overall plan as we move forward, we're reassessing individual homes right. in the city of Philadelphia moving forward. Um, there will not be a concerted effort of all three of those particular organizations working together. The OPA will just take the lead and will BRT just follow and then I guess revenue will just chime in as needs so, be? In terms of actually doing the assessments, so that's, I mean, that's obviously that's OPA's yes, OPA function, but clearly impacted a lot by BRT and kind of the amount of time they're spending on the appeals process. So those two things interact really closely. I mean, the more time they're doing, they're spending on appeals, the less time they can be spending on their assessment function. Yes. So this year obviously was kind of unique in that not only were all the properties reassessed, but there were some significant changes in values because there hadn't been this type of reassessment in years. Ever. Right? So I've, and you know that better yes. than anyone. Mm -hmm. So there were more appeals than you'd see in a typical year and probably more complex issues. So it, it, it will take longer to get through that process, um, which means that the OPA is spending more time on that, which is why there's not a 15 I assessment. I understand that. So that's why those two really need to work closely together. Yes. I mean, the way it affects revenue is on the billing side. Mm -hmm. That's an OPA issue. That's an OPA interface. When BRT changes a, a value, that goes to OPA, mm -hmm. and then OPA will send it to, to revenue. revenue. So OPA and revenue need to work really closely. OPA and BRT need to work really closely. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Good. Thanks, Chair. I was waiting for Mr. Bowe to volunteer to come to the table. <laughs> <laughs> you can always call me. <laughs>
Uh, since you volunteered to come to the table, I think you know the question. Uh, what is the finance department's analysis uh, as relates to BRT appeals? Do you wait for them to be over? Do you track them on an annual basis? Do you track, track them geographically in terms of how appeals are going? And you heard the questions that I asked related to uh, tax abated properties and those type of things where there could be a revenue loss in terms of what was projected. So how do you actually do that and when do you let us know how the appeals are going and, and how that number may have changed? Right. So in the budget, we have a projection on what we think appeal losses will be. Um, we assumed a 50% increase in appeal losses, about $30 million in losses. Uh, so that's what's in the budget. And then we're um, tracking as the process goes through the, what's actually happening with appeals and looking at, and it's really early, so we, it's really too early to tell, um, but we'll be tracking on a regular basis what appeal losses look like as a percent of assessed value. I, I get all that. When will you change your projections? At what point? At what point uh, will you let us know what's happening? Um, so we've changed already in some ways because um, looking at the schedule, uh, and the original projection was that all the appeals would be done by the end of this fiscal year. So that clearly isn't going to happen. So our projection now is based on the majority of those appeals being resolved next year. Um, and since um, when you appeal this year, you pay the old amount rather than the new amount, we essentially assumed that anything that wasn't heard this year, we treated it like an appeal loss. So, so you and that will come back next year after the appeals, at least a portion of it would. So is your, is your new number based upon those things that are under appeal and the assumption that they will pay the current tax, tax bill? In 14, for the ones that aren't heard, um, and then in 15, that there would be, after appeals are heard, some of that revenue would come back. So what's that new number? It was 30 million. It is now what? Uh, do you know what it is by year? 14 and 15. Well, I'll get back to you. We'll get you those exact numbers for each year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Being not Okay, thought somebody teed up there. Being no further questions, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. All right, our last, yeah, Rob, you might as well stay there. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're t our next area is revenue tax bills. Commissioner, hello again. Uh, good morning again. My name is uh, Clarina Tolson. Yes. And I'm pleased to be here, part of the Committee of the Whole, to address a couple of uh, council bills. Bills number 140148 and bill number 140147. Did you have a prepared statement? Yes, okay, yes, please sir. proceed. I'm sorry. Please. <laughs> I'm here to testify in support of Bill number 140148, which extends the authorization to the school district to impose a real estate tax in fiscal uh, 2015. This bill will continue the combined city and schools tax rate of 1.34%. 55% of the funds raised through the property tax go to the school district. The city's five-year plan anticipates that the rate will remain in place over the life of the plan. I'm also here to testify in support of Bill Number 140147, which extends the authorization for the school district to impose the UNO tax, or use and occupancy tax, to fiscal 2015. The business use and occupancy tax uh, is a tax on the business, trade, or other commercial use and occupancy of real estate located in Philadelphia. The tax is collected and the returns are filed by the owner of the property. The estimated current use and occupancy tax revenue is projected to be $138.3 million in fiscal 15, all of which is allocated to the School District of Philadelphia. 
In fiscal 2015, the tax rate will remain 1.77 percent. For the tax year that, that began July 1, 2013, and thereafter, there is a 177,000 exemption amount from the assessed value of each property actually used for the purposes of doing business. This translates into a 2,000 annual tax exemption. Both bills are essential for generating the funds we need to support our schools. We request a continuance of these bills so that they can be heard on May 5th, May 5th so that they may be heard at uh, the same time as the other bills related to the uh, school district. We thank you for your opportunity to testify today. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Bob, you have anything to add or just? Okay. Just here for more here support. To, yeah, here for, okay. <laughs> um, Not that clearly needs that. <laughs> uh, Commissioner, for the record, the amount of money that's located in, in the proposed tax rates, the real estate and the UNO, uh, how, how, mu how much money is located in those for uh, delinquent collections? Delinquent collections. Yeah. One moment, please, sir. Sure. I'm going to ask the mic to come up to make sure I get the right numbers here. Mm -hmm. For school district, give me one moment, I'll give you the number. Our estimate for our current um, delinquent or prior taxes due is $62 million. Okay. And that's increased from last fiscal year? Or? That's for uh, fiscal 14. Mm -hmm. um, an increase from, uh, last, from the prior year, yes. It is. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Johnson? Thank you. Mm -hmm. How you doing, Commissioner Tulsa? Yes, good afternoon, sir. Or good morning, sir. Just a couple questions regarding. Uh, do, do, do you know? Well, do you know off top the percentage of um, individuals who enter into payment plans under our um, individuals who enter the enter in the tax? I'm sorry, individuals who enter into payment plans who foreclose on their homes through our city's payment plans? Uh, payment agreements? Yeah, payment agreements. Thank you, Commissioner. Surely. Um, Just want to get an idea. Surely. For calendar year um, 13, we had approximately 30,000. Uh, payment agreements. Uh, calendar year 14 to date, we're still in the midst of that, obviously. It's only uh, four months in. We have approximately 21,500. 21? Yes. And out of those, out of the numbers for 13, do we have the amount who actually, um, who houses are actually foreclosed on based upon them not? adhering to their payment agreement? Uh, no, I do not. If you can provide, can certainly look to you can provide investigate that for that. me. Uh, for 13, obviously we're in the middle of 14, but um, year to date will still be sufficient for me. And it's just based upon some research we're doing. And that's citywide, correct? Yes. Is it possible for you to break it down in the districts? Is we would do our to very pull, best. Pull zip codes or the second councilmatic district? If you can, that will yes. be very, very helpful for me. We will investigate both numbers. Okay. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. DeBeau, uh, these bills are being continued. I thought you were still at the table. <laughs> Sorry, we were trying to figure out the answer to your last question. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> these bills uh, will be continued to May 5th. Uh, you are aware of the tax abatement bill that's scheduled for that day? I am. 
And you are aware of the legal opinion associated with that bill? I am not. There is a solicitor's opinion related to that bill. I have uh, not seen that. Okay. Uh, beyond that opinion, um, are you aware of the flexibility the SRC may or may not have with regard to the abatement bill if enacted? What the abatement bill says the SRC's role would be? Is that what you mean? And what flexibility they may have with regard to the abatement program if that bill is enacted? I think I, I, think I am, yes. Okay. Uh, will the law department be prepared to respond to that on May 5th? beyond the legal opinion that's already been issued. So are you asking that we have someone from law here to do that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, two years ago, we submitted a report that showed the large amount of delinquent real estate that was owned by non-residential owners um, and also looked at the percentage of delinquency um, that they had in their respective hometowns versus in the city of Philadelphia. Have you, in your collection efforts, developed a strategy to go after um, individuals who are absentee owners that kind of take Philadelphia for granted? Surely. Uh, there was recent state, thank you, Councilman. There was recent state legislation um, that allows um, uh, counties to lien properties in counties outside of their home, um, home base. Uh, we have been working with uh, the courts and prothonotaries around the state uh, to develop a process. And our expectation is that uh, within, I think, the next two months, um, two and a half months, we should be in, uh, have a system in place and be pursuing liens so that if you live in um, uh, in uh, Lower Marion and you own property in Philadelphia that you don't pay taxes on, that we can then lien your property in Lower Marion. Do you recall the size of that particular universe or receivable? I remember a figure, but um, if you have it close to your mind, I'd like to know what the potential um, for that collectible would be. Council, I don't recall that number right now, but I will get it for you. Well, in my recollection, we, we, ha we have it. I just don't recall it, and I don't want to misstate it. It was closing in on 400 million uh, as a universe, um, and that the, you know, that that's that qual quality of um, folk that that were out there. If in fact 50 percent, 20 percent of that could come in, it would solve a whole lot of revenue problems. And I, I don't know what the amount was, but it was staggering. Um, so in two months, we hope to be able to implement that. That should create a spike in receivables, I would imagine. I may not care too much about a North Philadelphia property or a West Philadelphia property that I've waited to speculate its way back into worth, but I sure enough will care about my lower Marion home uh, and the stigma that a sheriff sale or lean might mean to that. So Absolutely. I think that's a powerful tool uh, on your tool belt that will get us a spike in um, people with suddenly good conscience uh, and wanting to pay their debts to Philadelphia. You're right, Councilman. I look forward to it. We'll get the information. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you, Councilman. Being no further questions, thank you all very much for coming. Um, thank you for all the work you do. Um, this committee will stand in recess until this evening, uh, April 22nd at 6 o'clock, at which time we will reconvene here in room 400 City Hall for public testimony on the proposed operating and capital budgets. Thank you all very much. Thank you, yeah, thank you.